So uh, welcome all to the Horvitz seminar meeting. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today, uh, the seminar features uh, Offer Zaituni from the Weizmann Institute, who will tell us about small perturbations of non-Hermitian matrices. Okay. Hi. So it's a bit weird to give the seminar this way for me. Uh, for some of them who are teaching all the time, it's probably the new normal. Um, can you just let me know if you hear me? Okay. We hear you, Arthur. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, perturbations of non-hermitian matrices. So to, to introduce the uh, setup, um, this is a this is a, a matrix that you probably can can uh, see. So this is a, a nilpotent matrix. It has zeros on the diagonal and one diagonal of non-zero elements uh, above the above the diagonal. And um, imagine you are going to your computer. Uh, and you ask your computer to do the following. You take a, you take a, a random unitary matrix, you conjugate the matrix JN by it, and you ask the computer to compute the spectrum. Now, of course, the spectrum of the original matrix JN uh, is uh, just zero. All the eigenvalues are zero. And by conjugating, uh, nothing has happened. So the spectrum is still zero. But then if you ask your computer to simulate that, what you see is this. So what you see here is a plot of, uh, I think it's maybe 4,000 by 4,000 matrix. And uh, you see that all or most of the eigenvalues are of modulus one and may, maybe you don't see it in the simulation, but if you plot a histogram, you will discover that they are more or less uniformly distributed on the unit circle. So the question is, what is going on? Uh, the observation that such phenomena occur goes back, num numeric numerical analysts have known that for a long time. Uh, it goes by the name of, uh, of uh, pseudospectrum. And um, the pseudospectrum is exactly the locus of eigenvalues that you will see when you do something to your original matrix. So we are trying to understand this kind of phenomena. And uh, maybe I should say that th this notion that numerical analysts have uh, uh, are re uh, relate to worst case per perturbations. So they kind of ask the following question. You take a a matrix, a non-hermitian, you perturb it by a tiny bit, and you ask where do the eigenvalues move? Or in fact, another way to rephrase the question is how big, where is the locus of sites where the resolvent of the perturbed matrix is large, okay? So that's the notion of pseudospectrum, and, uh, and the notion is typically stated in terms of the worst case perturbation. So you take perturbations bounded in, in norm by something, and you ask what is the worst case. Being a probabilist, of course, I will not ask anything about worst case, I will ask about typical behavior. So I'll come back to that in just a moment. So in order to answer these questions, uh, it turns out that a good a good notion to remember is uh, uh, for a measure, a probability measure on the complex plane to discuss the logarithmic potential. So the logarithmic potential is just the integral of uh, the measure against the function log of z minus x. And um, it's a very useful notion among other things because if mu n converges weakly to mu, then uh, the logarithmic potential also converges Lebesgue almost every, everywhere and vice versa. So the logarithmic potential is a proxy, convergence of logarithmic potentials is a proxy for discussing con weak convergence of mass. 
Now for the, uh, why is it useful for, for matrices or for random matrices? Because if you are discussing the empirical measure of eigenvalues, which I will denote by Ln or Lna so throughout the talk today, uh, the logarithmic potential, well, it's the integral of the log, of the modulus of the log, so it's just up to the scaling by, by n, it's the, uh, it's um, uh, just the log determinant of the matrix. So in fact, there is, let me correct it here. So there is a, uh, the log potential is nothing but the determinant of a shifted version of, of, of A. And you will note that what is written here is a Hermitian matrix. It's Z minus A times Z minus A star. And in particular, this brings the question of computing spectra of non-Hermitian matrices to questions about Hermitian matrices, okay? Um, so, so in particular, um, uh, you maybe all know that uh, the spectrum of Hermitian matrices is stable with respect to perturbations. This, uh, there are many manifestations of, of this fact. Uh, and in particular, Viles inequalities allow you to show that when you add a bounded perturbation or a small perturbation to a Hermitian matrix, the spectrum doesn't move much. Okay, so, uh, one precursor to everything I'm going to be talking about is a theorem of Sniadi from about uh, 20 years ago. And it's a good uh, opportunity to introduce some notation. So suppose I have a sequence of matrices AN where the sequence is in N, so the dimension increases, okay? And suppose that they converge in, in star moments to an operator A. So what does that mean very loosely? It means that if I have a, an arbitrary non-commutative polynomial P in A n and A n star, then one over n, the trace of that converges to the trace of P of A a star. So, uh, I don't want to spend time on defining what exactly is meant by the right-hand side, but you should think of a space of operators together, an algebra of operators together with the operation of a, a trace operation, uh, which means that A is really an element of some C star algebra. Okay, so, so this convergence just means that there is a limiting operator in the sense uh, that when you take traces of non-commutative polynomials, you will, uh, you will have convergence. So suppose you have that, and now suppose that you add a small perturbation. So at the moment, Gn is going to be Gaussian. So this is going to be a Ginebri matrix. It's a Gaussian matrix with IID entries, okay? So this is a perturbed version. The scaling is such that N to the minus one half Gn is a matrix of norm of order one. And its eigenvalues are uniformly distributed on the unit disk, okay? So that's how scaling is taken. And think of T as being a small parameter. So what Sniadi proved is that if you look at the empirical measure of AN, of the eigenvalues of AN, then in the limit where first the dimension goes to infinity and then the strength of the perturbation goes to zero, you converge to a measure called the Brown measure, which is a measure whose potential is given by the log potential of A. So you just look at the modulus of Z minus A and you, you take the log, the, the log of that and you integrate it against the law of A, okay? So that's, uh, that's Niadi's theorem. So it identifies both the limit and the uh, the order of limits in which you have to take that. 
Note that AN could be our nilpotent matrix. Now, it's, it's not very hard to convince yourself that the limit of AN in star moment is simply a unitary operator on the unit circle, which corresponds to the shift, because the infinite limit of AN is really just a shift operator on L2. So this will just be an operator uh, which you can realize in many different ways in terms of Fox spaces, etc. I don't want to get into that. But what is important is that the limit of AN in star moment is just a, 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 an operator which has uh, uh, its spectrum on the unit circle and it's uniform on the unit circle. So uh, what this statement means is just that you can find a sequence of noise that regularizes the empirical measure, namely that such that the, when you take the noise going to zero at the, together with the dimension, you will converge to something which is uniform on the unit circle in the case of our nilpotent. Before I, 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 uh, um, before I, I, uh, I move on, I just want to mention to the stochastic analysis aficionados in the audience, the proof of Sniadi is a beautiful idea in stochastic analysis. What he did is he just looks at the singular, so we already agreed that it's enough to understand uh, log potentials, which means it's enough to understand the singular values. Because uh, the, the determinant of Z minus A times z minus a star involves the singular values of z minus a. The only problem, it's very easy to compute the limiting empirical distribution of the singular values of z minus a. But uh, because, uh, for example, you can compute the moments of z minus a times z minus a star and just use combinatorics to find out what those are. So that's, that's not very hard, and you would think that this is enough to get weak convergence, but of course, log is a singular function. It has a singularity at zero, so you cannot deduce convergence of the log potential unless you know some information about small singular values. So the whole point of Sniadi's proof is to control small singular values of uh, a n of t, and the way he does it, he compares the singular values of a n of t to the singular values of just the Ginebri part. And those are very well understood. So uh, uh, what he shows is that there is a stochastic order between them. Namely, the, the singular values as a vector of a n of of, of, of a n of t, of this uh, perturbed uh, matrix, are larger than those for the perturbation by itself. And uh, the way he proves that, he just writes down, the, he uses the fact that gn is Gaussian. You can write an evolution of the singular values. It satisfies a stochastic differential equation. And then you observe by, by comparison theorems for stochastic differential equations that uh, the flow, the stochastic flow, preserves monotonicity. And in particular, you reach, so the way you write the stochastic differential equation, you, you start with initial condition A n, and then you add a Brownian motion, a matrix whose entries are Brownian motion. And you write the evolution of the singular values. And because of uh, monotonicity preservation, you get that you are uh, larger than the same solution when you started from zero. Okay, so that's what Sniadi proved. And uh, what this says, what this immediately leads you to ask is, okay, that's all very nice, but what happens not in this order of limits, but rather when t goes to zero in a, way, in a way that I want to control, not in a way that comes from triangulation, okay? Now, it's clear that if you replace the order of limits 
if you first take the limit in T and then the limit in N, then nothing interesting happens because the spectrum of A and of T converges for N fixed and T going to zero to the spectrum of AN. So there's an issue of order of limits and of rates of limits, and that's what we are going to discuss, okay? So let's go back to, to this matrix and ask ourselves, how did this phenomenon that the spectrum is far from the initial spectrum happen? So if we start with this matrix, and uh, which has a uh, spectrum at zero, and we add to it, uh, we add to it small noise. And what do I mean by small noise? So it's a noise that decays polynomially. So we said that n to the minus one half gn is normalized such that the, the limiting eigenvalues are of order one, and the limiting singular values are also of order one. So we take gamma larger than one half, which means that the norm of this perturbation goes to zero. Okay, and now look at the empirical measure of eigenvalues and the theorem is that this converges weakly to the uniform measure on the unit circle. And uh, the, this is a theorem I'm going to describe to you uh, the ideas behind the proof. There is an earlier version of that of Davis and Hager which found the locus of the limiting empirical measure. Um, And this is again the simulation. It's not exactly a simulation I showed you in the beginning. You can see, if you observe carefully, that this is a real noise simulation, right? Where all eigenvalues come in pair. Okay, so what is going on before the proof? So what is going on is that the original matrix is extremely unstable, and here is why. Suppose that on the left bottom corner, I put an entry delta n, a small entry delta n. So now, and I ask you now to compute the spectrum. So the, the, the characteristic polynomial is particularly easy to write. And you see that the eigenvalues are just the nth roots of that perturbation, which means that as long as the perturbation goes to zero, not too fast, namely sub-exponentially, you will see something in the limit. Indeed, the roots are going to be delta n to the power one over n times the roots of unity. So you see that it converges in terms of angle, it converges to the uniform measure. And in terms of modulus, it converges to one if the perturbation is polynomial, okay? And that's really what is going on. And you could ask yourself, okay, that's all very nice, but why, when I add noise, why is this particular perturbation being picked up? Okay, so there's a general criterion for that, which is developed in the paper I mentioned, which says the following. Suppose that I have an operator A in this C star algebra that I that is somewhat in the background, and that is regular. What does regular mean? It means that when I shift it, there are not too many eigenvalues near zero, not too many, uh, not, eigen, not too many singular values near zero. Uh, quantitatively, it's exactly what is written here, namely that if I take uh, the integral of uh, the shifted version of A, and I integrate log x against that, then there is no, no contribution near zero. Okay. So suppose that we have a sequence of matrices that converge in star moment to such an operator A, which is regular. And suppose in addition that the empirical measure of A converges to the Brown measure of the limiting A, okay? So the empirical, so there are two conditions here. First of all, convergence in star moment. In our example, this condition is satisfied. In the nilpotent example, this condition is satisfied. Whereas uh, uh, the second condition, which is that the empirical measure converges to the Brown measure, clearly is not satisfied because the empirical measure is a Dirac at zero, okay? 
But suppose you have that, and suppose that gamma is larger than one half, which means the noise goes to zero. Then, uh, when you look at the empirical measure of the perturbed thing, it converges, it, it, it doesn't see the perturbation. So this is a stability result, right? So far I've been discussing instability. Noise is destroying some stability, some uh, convergence. But here it's just the opposite. You start from a good AN, then noise doesn't cause damage. And um, you could ask why is this relevant to our example? Because in our example, as I said, these assumptions are not satisfied. So the answer to that is that there's another statement which says the following. Suppose that I have the same convergence in star moments as I discussed, but in addition, I have a small va polynomially vanishing perturbation that I bring from home. Okay, this is someone, something that I, I hold in my pocket and I exhibit it to you and I show that AN plus that perturbation does converge to the right object. Then the original matrix perturbed by noise will also converge to the same limit. Okay, so in our example, so th this means that it's enough to find a perturbation with the right limiting property. And in our example, I just showed you which one it was. The perturbation EN was just this one, right? It was zero everywhere except for delta N in the corner. Delta N converged to zero polynomially and I had this zero. Okay. So once you see this statement, you can think maybe this always work. Maybe I can always find, maybe always I converge to the brown measure of the limiting operator. And all I have to do is to find this very special perturbation. Unfortunately, the answer to that is not. So if you take a matrix, uh, which I call matrix nilpot maximally nilpotent, so this is like J, but only of dimension B. And now you create a matrix that is a block matrix. X, each of the J, J, JB are uh, nilpotent matrices of dimension B. Okay, and you just concatenate them like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's very easy to convince yourself that if B goes to infinity, then JBN converges in star moments to the same limits as J. But what you can show is that if B is a multiple of log N, then you do not converge. The empirical measure of the perturbed operator does not converge to the uniform measure on the unit circle. You can see a simulation of that. And in fact, in follow-up work, with uh, Elliot Paquet and Ohad Feldheim, we showed that you have the following. If you take Jordan blocks of that type that I just discussed, not necessarily the same, then uh, you can compute the limit. So this is an example of a simulation which uh, you had uh, different diagonal values and you add it to that blocks of the type I just discussed, namely of dimension here, which is constant log n. Okay, and, uh, um, and you can write down explicitly the uh, uh, limit spectrum. You have a similar theorem, but the limit spectrum is definitely not the one you get from star moment convergence. Okay, um, so then you can ask yourself what happens in, okay, this is a bit contrived, what about more general mo models? So here are a couple of examples. So this is an example where you take Jn plus Jn square. So Jn plus Jn x square is just a matrix that has zero on the diagonal, one on the next diagonal, one here, and zero elsewhere. So it's a toplitz matrix, an upper triangular toplitz matrix with two 
non-vanishing diagonals. And what you see in the simulation is uh, the eigenvalues of the noisy version on the left side and the eigenvalue of a randomly uh, uh, a simulation of a randomly conjugated version of the matrix with no noise on the right hand side. So first of all you again see that there is a phenomena that suddenly eigenvalues instead of being at zero they go to some curve in the complex plane. And second if you look at the left side there are stray eigenvalues and somehow it looks quite different in different regions. For example, here there are no stray eigenvalues. Here you have stray eigenvalues and here you have stray eigenvalues. Try to be not color blind and just keep in mind one of the colors. The different colors are describe different noise intensities. So you see somehow the, the field in this region looks quite different than what happens in the inner region. And so what we would like to understand is A, can we describe what this spectral curve is, this limiting uh, support of the spectral measure, and B, what are the outliers? So this is what I intend to do in the rest of the talk. Okay. By the way, if there are questions, my chat is open. So if you send a chat, I can see that you are, uh, you are asking and I can address it in real time and not only at the end. Okay, so these are two other examples. The first one is you take the same JN, but on the diagonal, you put two different things. Here on the diagonal, you just go from minus one to one in a linear way. So this is linearly interpolated. And then one above. And you add noise. Again, the left side is when you add noise, the right side is when you randomly conjugate. In the bottom simulation, what you see are one here, and here you have IID uniform. I think uniform here probably between minus one and one. Or maybe minus two, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's minus one or minus two. Minus two, it's written, minus two. Okay, so you see two things from this uh, simulation. One is that uh, in spite of the fact that the empirical measure of the entries on the diagonal is essentially the same or up to scaling is the same, the answer is very different. And you can ask what, is the, what are these limits? So that's the next result. So suppose I take this matrix and I add small noise and if the n are iid if the entries of the diagonal matrix are iid uniform on minus 1 1 then you can prove convergence to the of the limit to an explicit function in fact you can characterize the log potential of the limit and the log potential of the limit is given here on the right side so that's one thing on the other hand, if you have a toplitz upper triangular matrix of this form, so toplitz upper triangular means that you can write your matrix as Tn, which is sum of Ai j to the power i, where j is, uh, is our friend, this maximally, this is j. Okay. Then, after you add noise, uh, the limit of the empirical measure is just the law of sum of ai u to the power i, where u is uniform on the unit circle. This means that you are pushing forward the uniform measure on the unit circle by the symbol 
of the operator, the symbol of the operator is just sum of a i z to the power i. This is what I refer to as the symbol, okay? So um, this also extends to twisted toplets, which means that the a i are, are changing slowly. This was the case in my example, where I took on the diagonal going from minus one to one in a linearly interpolated way. This is an example of a twisted toplet, so the, the coefficients move slowly. And then what you get as a limiting empirical measure is just an average, a convex combination of what you would get if locally all you saw is a fixed value on the diagonal. So that's the theorem. And uh, it confirms some simulations and predictions that people were doing based on pseudo spectrum. And some two dimensional, uh, two diagonal toplets cases were also studied by Shostran and Vogel uh, by a different method that I will discuss uh, later on. So, how do we prove such results? Well, uh, you take your matrix, suppose I have Tn, which is some matrix plus a small noise. And suppose that, remember that I need to understand the uh, singular values of Mn shifted by Z, because that's what appears in the computation of the log potential. So rewrite the uh, singular values of Zi minus Mn, rewrite them in terms of the singular values arranged non-decreasing, okay? So Sn are small, those are the small eigenvalues, small singular values, and Bn are the large. We will discuss in a moment what small means. And then your noise becomes, a, you can also divide it to blocks in the same, in the same way. And now here is a definition of uh, N star. N star is just the moment in which the singular values are not polynomially small. So th this is kind of a fancy definition, but that's really what it means. Up to a certain level of polynomially small, you put it in Sn, and above this you call it the bulk, the Bn, okay? And what I should emphasize is that in all these examples, if you take Z, for example, if you take Z minus J, okay, if you take Z minus J times Z minus J star, this is going to be a matrix of the form Z square plus one, one, one. Or, or minus one, if I think it's minus one here. Okay, uh, sorry, there's a Z here. So if Z is on the unit circle, what you recognize here is uh, the Laplacian. For example, take Z in modulus equal to one, then this is exactly the Laplacian. So this is Z, this is Z star. And therefore, it may have an eigenvalue equal to zero. It may have a small singular value. So Z minus J has a small singular value. And if Z is very close to the unit circle, indeed, you may have small singular values. And uh, the, the basic uh, result is that if you want to compute the log determinant, of your noisy matrix. So Tn is just this matrix here. This is Tn. And you want to compute the log determinant of Tn. What the noise does effectively is just erase the small singular values. So they just disappear. Okay? And uh, the proof of this statement is done by uh, uh, essentially concentration inequalities. It's not very hard. So, um, so what this tells you is that you need to understand 
the small singular values of Mn. Note that Mn is a non-noisy matrix. It's just a deterministic matrix that we are perturbing. So, so with this theorem, everything becomes a question of understanding the small singular values. For toplitz matrices, it's pretty simple because you can write recursions. You can rewrite everything in terms of, of, uh, of uh, solutions to difference equations whose, whose uh, the order of the difference is just the degree of the symbol. So you can get your a handle on the small singular values and this is how you prove this kind of results. For, I should say that for uh, the case of random diagonal, something similar happens, but what the game will involve uh, a certain Lyapunov exponent of products of random matrices, which you can, in the two by two case, you can compute explicitly. Okay. Now, uh, uh, for, this, for this statement, um, we needed Gaussian noise. The main region, reason we needed Gaussian complex noise is that the first step in the proof is to conjugate everything and bring the matrix Mn to a diagonal form without changing the distribution of the noise. And this is okay if your noise is complex Gaussian and not okay otherwise. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, the main thing. Uh, maybe in terms of time, I will, uh, I will, uh, uh, I will just uh, say that in fact the main result for the toplitz operator extends to not necessarily triangular operator, but actually two-sided symbol, bounded symbol, and not necessarily Gaussian noise, but just a noise where you have control on the, uh, on, where you have control on the uh, uh, small singular values of the noise and of its, uh, its Hilbert-Schmidt noise. So IID entries, quite general IID entries would work for this kind of result. Okay. Good, so let me skip the, the proof. Let me, ah, this is important though. So, uh, let me just say that uh, a, a related, but with a different method uh, based on the Grushin problem I will tell you about in a second, uh, proof of the same result was obtained independently and more or less concurrently by uh, Schostrand and Vogel. Okay. So uh, let me skip these proofs, okay. And let me tell you something about the Grushin problem. So, so this is an alternative that was developed by uh, Shostan and Vogel based on earlier work of Shostan and co-workers and of Grushin, of course. And the idea adapted to our setting is the following. Suppose that A is a matrix with certain singular values. And suppose that G is a perturbation and you want the eigenvalues of A plus delta G, okay? So now there's a bit of linear algebra. So you can write everything in terms of the singular value decompositions of A and fix M integers such that uh, um, M captures all the small singular values of your matrix A, okay? And now introduce the following matrix P, which is essentially take your matrix A and look at, on the off diagonal, at the projections on the small singular value decomposition uh, part. And this is a matrix of dimension N plus M. You can check that it's a bijection. Uh, so it's a, it's a uh, even if you have zero singular values, it will be a bijection. It will, uh, it will uh, be invertible. 
So you can write its inverse, and you can write explicit ex expressions for the inverse. And what is important is because of these explicit expressions, you have uh, norm estimates on different parts of the inverse of P, okay? So this is just linear algebra, you should uh, trust me on that. But one thing you should note right away is that the uh, determinant of P square erases the small singular values. So A might have small singular values, maybe even zero singular values, but the determinant of P somehow erases it. And by the deterministic equivalence results I mentioned earlier, um, it's kind of the right thing to do because we know that in good situations, the only thing we are going to see are the small singular values. Okay, so uh, now let's look at the uh, perturbed matrix and do the same game, namely put A delta and put the same R minus and R plus as before. So do not change the R minus and R plus, which were built from the projection to the small singular values space. But now apply the inverse of P from the right, and you will see that the inverse of P almost diagonalizes P delta, except for a small perturbation that you can write up there. And you can actually, in this case, try to invert back P delta. So P delta was this matrix, you can try to invert it. And you can write a, a power series expansion, a Neumann expansion of the inverse. And the point is that if you have good control on the norms, and for that you truncated the small singular values in doing that, then uh, this series converges. And moreover, you can recover the determinant of A delta from the determinant of P delta plus the bottom right element, plus something about the bottom right element of E delta, E delta minus plus. So what you need to understand is this E minus delta plus, and if you do your truncation properly, it will be small. And then you will have a formula of the log of that A delta, which is what you want in terms of the log of that of P delta, which we are going to compute in a second. So this is a description. And now you can write what is the log that of P delta compared to the log that of P zero. Remember P zero we know. We know everything about P zero because it has no, no perturbation. So you, you, you differentiate, you write what it is, and you see that you get uh, something that has to do with delta times your noise times alpha to the minus one, where alpha was the level in which you did your truncation. So if your noise is small enough, such that the right-hand side here goes to zero, then you can compute the log that of P delta. And remember, log that of P0 was just the large singular values, the product of the large, uh, sorry, the sum of the log of the large singular values. So all this together tells you that the difference between the two is bounded by this term that you are going to make small by choosing the proper alpha. And uh, okay, so, so this is, uh, this is it. You can do a lower bound by a similar method. So that allows you to compute the log determinant of a small. So you see that what you need from the noise for this kind of computation is not too much. Um, okay. So, so this gives a version of the same deterministic equivalence that I told you before but now for completely general noise. So now we have a deterministic equivalence for a general matrix. You give me any general, any matrix you want. 
I compute its small singular values. If there are not too many of them, then I can tell you what is the limit of the perturbation. And uh, the, key, the key question, if you give me a matrix, is can I compute the small singular values? For toplitz matrices, this is possible. For example, I don't know how to do it for twisted toplitz, which are not upper triangular. So if you have a toplitz matrix with slowly varying entries on the diagonal, uh, in general, uh, I don't know how to compute the small singular values. Okay. Let me, in the time remaining, let me switch to discuss outliers. So these are the two, two examples I've shown you before. The, the first one is Jn plus n to the minus gamma Gn. The second one has one more diagonal on, uh, one more uh, diagonal. And we know that outliers, so we know from the results I have quoted that the empirical measure converges to these curves. And these curves are exactly the push forward of the unit circle by the symbol. Which incidentally, I have not mentioned it before, for toplitz operators, uh, this push forward is exactly the spectrum of the infinite, it's a boundary of the spectrum of the infinite toplitz matrix viewed as an operator on L2 of Z plus. So if you take your matrix and you look, for example, if you take this matrix and you look at the infinite one, this is just a shift and the spectrum of the shift is just a unit circle. So, okay. So now question, what is the structure of outliers? And in order to, uh, let me tell you the results and then I'll go backwards to a description of them. So in the left case, in the case of the simple, the, of the, the, uh, the basic uh, Jordan block, uh, the outliers are just zeros of a limiting Gaussian field. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, a standard field, uh, a standard Gaussian analytic function. I'll write the expression in just a second. On the right hand side, there are actually two cases. And this is a function of Z. So if you write Zi plus Jn plus Jn square, you write it in terms of the roots of this quadratic e equation, call it lambda one and lambda two. Then, uh, if both lambda i's are larger in modulus than one, there are no singular values. This corresponds, there are no eigenvalues. This corresponds to this region outside the curve. If one of them is larger than one and one of them is smaller than one, the outliers are roots of a Gaussian field, a particular Gaussian field. And this field actually, you can guess what it is by looking at the characteristic polynomial and looking at the terms that have just one Gaussian in them. So this is this region. And uh, in case both roots are smaller than one, outliers are roots of a certain analytic function but unfortunately, the coefficients of these analytic functions are not Gaussian. They involve product of pairs of your noise matrix, pairs of elements of your noise matrix. And I should add that any, you can see from these descriptions that nothing here is universal. In particular, if you change the noise, if Gn changes to a non-Gaussian noise, then even the Ga what I call the Gaussian analytic function will not be Gaussian anymore. It will just be an analytic function which coefficients which are IID random variables. Okay. So uh, how do you see this kind of uh, results or what is the description? So, so D0 is exactly the uh, order it counts how many singular values are larger than, how many roots are larger than one and how many are smaller than one. 
and uh, the regions decay are just the region determined by that. So those are region where you have two, one, you may have more than two, etc. Now the spectrum of the infinite toplitz operator is just uh, 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 a of a of uh, uh, it's just the uh, uh, a of s one and uh, uh, the main theorem is that if you look outside the spectrum, so if you look outside the limiting curve, there are no outliers. So this is joint work with Anirban Basak. And uh, if you look inside, okay, so you look at the field of eigenvalues in each of these regions. And the statement is that there are some uh, um, random sets which are li which are zeros of of certain random analytic functions, such that the zero the eigenvalues the process of eigenvalues inside the region DK converges to it. And this random sets are exactly as I said, there are polynomials in the lambda i of z, which happen to be analytic functions, and the coefficients of these polynomials are specific minors of the noise matrix of a particular size, which has to do with how many, how many uh, roots of the, of the shifted symbol are smaller than one. And there's a combinatorial description of all of that. And, uh, and I should say that in the particular cases, so this is a particular case of the uh, Jordan block, there are no outlier outside the disk. And inside the disk, uh, oh, there's an I missing here, I'm sorry. It's this random analytic function, and, the, and, and uh, in particular, in this particular case, you get a determinantal process with first intensity written as I wrote down, down here. So, so this is what happens here. The computation of intensity was performed earlier by Schostron and Vogel by the Grushin problem approach. Okay, let me write up, uh, wrap up uh, what I wanted to say. So one thing that I cannot do at the moment is a case of general twisted toplet symbols. I expect that the, end, the result is the same. The difficulty is that for toplet matrices, there are explicit expressions for uh, the, the determinant, explicit in the sense that you can compute limits uh, there's a formula due to WIDOM that allows you to compute uh, the limit of uh, log determinants, log toplitz determinants, normalized log toplitz determinants. It's, uh, it's extensions of Shego's theorem. However, um, for twisted toplitz determinants, there is no such formula in regions where you, you have non zero twisting uh, winding number of the of the curve. So that's exactly the region, region we are interested in. Um, so you can show that, there are no, for example, you can show in the uh, twisted toplitz case that there are no zeros outside the spectral curve given by uh, this convex combination of local spectral curves but you cannot show any, I cannot show anything about what happens inside. Uh, so the natural question about toplets with infinite symbols, all our computations here require the finite symbols. I should say that uh, uh, the, again, the Grushin problem, which captures in a better way analytic approximations to the pro problem, uh, allows you to do that if the rate of decay is fast enough. Uh, 
So that's work, recent work of Shostand and Vogel. And finally, it's very natural to discuss eigenvectors. The picture is very interesting. Um, um, for example, if you look at, the, at this matrix and you ask about eigenvectors, it turns out that, that this depends a lot on the strength of the noise. So if gamma is larger than one, actually if gamma is larger than three half, which means weak noise, the, eigenve the eigenvectors are pseudo modes, they really look like this. They are exponentially decaying with a scale here, which is n over log n. Uh, between three half and one, a similar picture occurs, but there are oscillations in this region. And for gamma between half and one, there's something very interesting that we only understand partially. It seems to be that the eigenvectors become a random process with correlation lengths that depends on gamma. So it's a process at the scale of a power of n, and the exact power depends on the gamma you use. So again, there's a very rich behavior. Uh, uh, these facts are kind of uh, proved. The one with the uh, random process is more speculative at this point. Okay, I'll stop here, and if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Offer. Um, and uh, we, we can pass to questions. Uh, um, you can uh, either unmute yourself and ask or write by chat. Uh, maybe I'll start with a question. Um, Offer, uh, in the uh, beginning example of the maximally nilpotent matrix, you showed us that there is a deterministic perturbation delta n, that if it's sub-exponential, you have the spectrum on the unit circle but you used a polynomially small noise. So if you were to use a, for that particular example, a noise which is even smaller, larger than polynomial, but still sub-exponential, would you still see the uniform distribution on the surface? Same answer. Uh, it would be the same yes. thing as yes. sub-exponential. Yes. But yes, in yes. more general examples, you need the polynomial. No, no, no. no. The polynomial is just for convenience and concreteness, no. The truth is that everything goes through as soon as you are not decaying. The, in all these examples, uh, in all these examples, uh, what happens is that the small singular values, so for example, let's not talk about the twisted case, but in the toplitz cases, there is a finite number of exponentially small singular values. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And after that, they are, uh, they are essentially not small anymore. Uh -huh, I see. So, so after that, they are larger than one over n or something like that. So any, if your noise is anything above this small singular values, you're, you're okay. I see. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions, please? Was either too clear or not clear? Um, yeah, could I ask? Hi, Ofer. Uh, Hi. Well, what time is it? It's uh, five thirty. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so what's the uh, what's the general um, definition of a Grushin problem? What does this mean in general? So uh, I, I, I don't know about general, but uh, so, so I'm not sure, uh, I didn't go and look uh, uh, at Groshin's work, but it's a way of regularizing, it's a way of regularizing a singular problem into a non-singular problem by augmenting the dimension. So essentially you keep track of projections to the small or to the singular parts of the operators or almost singular parts of the operators by augmenting the dimension. And the point is that once you have done that, this survives better perturbations. That's, that's really the idea. Uh, so I don't know if I can go back. 
let's see if I can go back to where I did that. Let's see. Uh, yes. So, so, so you see, the, 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 this is this is really the main the main point. So the main point is that uh, 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 on the one hand you have control of the log determinant in terms of of your unperturbed operator and some error, and you control this error by making uh, uh, bigger and bigger parts the parts that correspond to the small singular values, you kind of project away from them. That's, that's, that's okay. I don't know how, how well this answers your question, but, but the, the, uh, it's just an algebraic device to do projections to the space of larger singular values. Thanks. And of course, uh, maybe I should add that I have hidden here the fact the, 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 so in this upper bound, you don't use anything about the small singular values of the perturbation, right? It's only a norm bound. In the other direction, this is where it enters. Okay, where you want to show that the singular, that the perturbation does not have small singular values and therefore nothing remains in that part. Okay, which is really what is going on here. The noise matrix does not have small singular values. So even though your original matrix, for example, the, the maximal nilpotent matrix has exactly one singular value that is small. And this is causing all the damage when you compute, uh, when you compute uh, the log potential. Okay, but if you, if you add noise, the noise is masking it. And the way to capture it is exactly to do this decomposition into projection into that small subspace and the rest. And to show that because of the noise, the projection into that small subspace actually survives. It's not annihilated when you take the inverse. And any other questions? Okay. Okay. If no other questions, uh, we may all uh, want to uh, unmute themselves and uh, clap. And uh, we thank again uh, Offer Zaytuni for an excellent talk. Okay. And uh, thank you all for coming. We meet again uh, next week uh, with uh, the speaker, uh, Tal Ornstein from Berlin. Uh, I'll send an announcement. Um, Okay. Bye-bye.